Good morning, I'm Rick Trojan, the president of the board at HIA. And in the theme of the morning, we're gonna have an excellent, excellent seminar coming up for you guys. I wanna welcome you to our educational webinar series. Uh, we're glad you could join us today to discuss our first topic of 2021, hemp-derived Delta-8 THC. It's a subject that's generated a tremendous amount of interest and excitement for a number of reasons. And we hope you'll leave today with a clearer understanding of Delta-8 and the scientific, legal, and policy issues surrounding it. Although this compound was first identified over half a century ago, it has been the subject of some medical studies. It has only recently gained popularity with consumers, creating yet another promising opportunity for hemp and the hemp industry. Inquiries to the HIA for information on the chemistry, effects, usage, and the legality of this hemp cannabinoid have increased exponentially. So it was an obvious choice for the topic for the first of our 2021 educational webinar series, a free service to the industry we intend to offer all year long. As the nation's foremost hemp-centric trade association, we believe in sowing the seeds for a thriving hemp economy by leveraging our most valuable resources, the expertise of our members. We asked two of our members, Vicente Cedarberg and Industrial Hemp Farms, both established leaders in their fields, to join us today and share their knowledge and insights on Delta 8 THD. Thank you very much to Matt Gunther from Industrial Hemp Farms and Sean Hauser of Vicente Cedarberg for their generosity in helping us out today. Speaking of lawyers, full disclaimer, this webinar is for educational services and is not legal advice. There are legal risks in commercial activity related to Delta-8 THC. Any company engaged in such activity should consult with legal counsel to address the applicable state and federal laws. HIA, its members, affiliates, and associates provide educational content only and are not responsible for the independent decisions based upon the opinions outlined in this presentation. So before we get into it, uh, we had quite a few questions submitted. We'll take questions obviously submitted during the um, presentation in the chat and ask them um, time allowing after uh, the presentation. But so we have some frequently asked questions we wanna cover uh, before we make the introductions to Matt and Sean. First, what is Delta-8? Delta-8 is a naturally occurring cannabinoid in the cannabis sativa L plant. It has been shown to have medical value since the mid 1900s. According to US patents, it's of note that CBD is typically 2% dry weight of hemp chafe. Delta-8 THC is approximately 0.2% dry weight and Delta-9 is approximately 0.1%. How is, how is Delta-8 manufactured? There are multiple methods of converting cannabinoids into Delta-8 THC. The primary method is from hemp CBD conversion process. Is Delta-8 legal? The 2018 Farm Bill removed all cannabinoids from the controlled substances list, including TH, Delta-9 THC less than 0.3 on a dry weight basis. Delta-8 is not specifically scheduled as a drug on the current Controlled Substances Act. Is Delta-8 just Delta-9 light? No, Delta-8 is an entirely separate and unique minor cannabinoid found in hemp not unlike CBC, CBG, or other minor cannabinoids. It is a more stable compound than Delta-9 THC, which can convert into CBD. And finally, is Delta-8 THC calculated in the total THC limit defined by the USDA? The USDA's final rule does not account for Delta-8 THC in total THC limit for compliant hemp. So with that, I'll make the introductions to our real stars of the show, the experts, Sean and Matt. Matt Gunther has been uh, professionally involved in the cannabis industry for the last six years, helping to guide industrial hemp farms, one of the country's top vertically integrated hemp farming and CBD wholesale companies for the last three years. He recently co-founded the American Cannabinoid Association, which allows him to follow his passion, applying science to cultivate the future of the cannabinoid industry both domestically and abroad. Sean Hauser. Sean's the partner at Vicente Cedarberg and chair of the firm's hemp and cannabinoid department. Sean helps marijuana and hemp companies navigate the intersections between state and federal law, including hemp law, food and drug law, regulatory compliance, 
licensing, general business representation, investment, and general business matters. As chair of VS Hemp and Cannabinoid Department, she advises clients on the legal landscape governing cannabinoids and hemp, help inform compliant business structures, maintain compliance with hemp, food and drug laws as they evolve and help inform solutions that best position clients for success at the state, national and international level. She's also been named one of Denver's top lawyers by 5280 Magazine the past five years. So with that, I'll welcome Sean and Matt. Sean, I'll hand it over to you to talk about the legal overview. Great, thanks Rick. Um, and thanks for, for having us today. Excited to talk about, excited to talk about Delta-8. And I'm really gonna go through the, the current legal landscape governing Delta-8 and you know, try and answer the question, is, is Delta-8 legal? And um, I think my, Slides will show up here in a second, but you know, wanted to reiterate now and um, throughout this that you know we as the hemp industry have a responsibility and to protect health and safety and you know do this right. And there are a lot of uncertainties um, about this this molecule. The, the law is evolving, so I appreciate everyone um, taking the time to get educated here. And walking through this so that we can, um, you know, help shape policy and ensure the science is there, and um, to you know make sure we produce safe and effective products going forward. So the the primary governing law is the, of course, the Controlled Substances Act, which is now amended by the Farm Bill, and under the plain language of the the, the Controlled Substances Act, now amended by the Farm Bill. Um, all hemp, which is the cannabis plant of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis, is no longer a controlled substance, in, in, as well as tetracannabinols in hemp, um, which are now, by virtue of the Farm Bill, removed from the CSA's definition of tetrahydrocannabinol. And notably, the definition of, um, of hemp, now legal, includes not just the plant under 0.3%, but the derivatives, extracts, cannabinoids, isomers, acids, salts, and salts of those isomers derived therefrom. So the, the primary question is, you know, what is Delta-8? To the extent it's a derivative extract isomer of hemp, it is um, not a controlled, controlled substance under the CSA. And what we'll get into um, in Matt's presentation is what, what is it? Is it an extract? Is it an isomer? And that determination may, may really depend on the specific product that's being produced um, and what kind of you know, purification process is included. Um, you know, is it truly a natural isomer, a natural derivative? Um, it, does it in fact fall within this exclusion? And that may not be the same for all Delta-8 on the market. Uh, regardless of whether a substance is ex excluded based on the plain language of the CSA, a substance can still be controlled if it is an analog of a controlled substance. Um, and I'll get into that in a second, but essentially the Analog Act was um, enacted to pre prevent the sale of you know, designer drugs, drugs that could be slightly modified, but have this in effect the same substance or same structure and effect of a controlled substance. So thinking of, you know, spice and, and K2 and those kind of designer drugs. And of course, to the extent Delta-8 is derived from marijuana, um, it is still Schedule 1. And as I mentioned, key in um, the Controlled Substance Act definition is um, is it an isomer? Is it an extract? Is it a derivative? Some isomers are not naturally occurring. Um, you know, we'll defer to Matt here on the chemistry, but um, not all isomers truly fall under this, this definition. So it, it may be a product specific question as to whether a substance meets the, the CSA exception. And also wanted to note what, what is clear is that Congress in enacting the Farm Bill, you know, include expressly intended to exclude um, derivatives of the legal hemp plant from CSA control. Um, so again, the question is, is the substance truly a derivative of legal hemp? Importantly, as many of you are aware, the DEA issued a final rule um, this past August, um, making a number of 
uh, purportedly conforming changes to the CSA, which are not the subject of the, the top of the conversation today, um, but also contained language regarding synthetics that could be interpreted to mean that the DEA considers Delta-8 to in fact be a controlled substance. And that definition um, is highlighted here where they say for synthetically derived tetrahydrocannabinols, the concentration of Delta-9 THC is not a determining factor in whether that material is a controlled substance. All synthetically derived tetrahydrocannabinols remain Schedule I controlled substances. So the term synthetic in here is not defined and could reasonably be interpreted to include Delta-8. And that's very important because that means th the DEA, you know, may interpret the Controlled Substances Act to mean that Delta-8 or at least certain Delta-8 products are controlled. And it comes down to, you know, one, the definition of, of synthetic um, and how the Delta-8 was, was produced. If it's deemed to have been derived from a human-controlled chemical reaction, um, it may in fact be a synthetic form of THC and thus a Schedule One controlled substance. Um, and again, coming down to is is this a naturally occurring isomer? Um, you know, how how was the the delta eight produced? And Matt's going to get into that in in much more detail. Um, you know, there are, are a number of counter arguments to DEA's position, both procedural and substantive. Um, you know, many argue that um, the isomerization process itself does not convert a cannabinoid into a synthetic one. Again, I think that will come down to, you know, the exact process and how much of it is, is naturally occurring versus um, a human-made reaction. Um, you know, another is procedural, going back to, you know, through DEA's history of, of how it is sought out to regulate THC and um, THC-containing compounds and whether you know, a final rule without notice and comment is the appropriate avenue to schedule this if it um, was not in effect scheduled already. So um, long story short, whether the whether Delta-8 um, is a controlled substance under the, the plain language of the farm bill um, is, is uncertain. There, I think a court could come down either way on that, depending on the science which, which will, and the chemistry, which we'll get into. Um, but much is going to depend on the chemical process, the, the process itself of the, um, the production of Delta-8 and the interpretation of the DEA final rule, which has not yet you know, been interpreted in a court of law. Importantly, um, the Federal Analog Act of 1986 also applies and would render a substance controlled um, when intended for human consumption if that substance is both um, uh, has the same chemical structure and same intended effect um, as a, a substance in Schedule One and Schedule Two, and therefore that substance would be treated as scheduled and you it would be unlawful to manufacture or distribute it. So the two prong test under the um, chemical structure is, is really one in which I think we'll, we'll look to Matt to answer some of these questions. But the, the first one is, you know, does the substance share a chemical structure substantially similar to that of a Schedule I or Schedule II controlled substance? So does Delta-8 have a structure similar enough to controlled THC to render it um, a controlled substance? And, you know, courts have been inconsistent in many cases and how they've analyzed this prong under the Analog Act. And it's unknown where they, how they would come down really on Delta-8. Um, as many of you know, and as Matt will get into, uh, Delta-8 THC and Delta-9 differ with respect to a single chemical bond, but they're not identical. Um, you know, they do have actual and perceived chemical and pharmacological similarities, um, but they um, also have some differences. DEA and its you know, recent resource guide lists Delta-8 as another name for THC, which indicates that at least DEA has um, come to the conclusion that you know, it, it deems Delta-8 to be similar enough um, to use the same terminology as THC. The second prong of the test is what is the actual or intended effect? Is this similar enough to warrant it being an analog? 
Um, so does the product have an actual or an intended effect that is substantially similar to or greater than the stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect on the central nervous system of a Schedule One or Schedule Two controlled substance? And again, this is one where you know courts would look to the analysis of pharmacological experts and, and chemists um, to determine the answer here. But we do know, you know, one, the existing data is limited, but it appears that Delta-8 does not have a pharmacological effect that is greater than Delta-9 THC, although, um, you know, it is known to be psychoactive, even though it's known to be less potent. Um, there's some grass notifications for um, hemp protein powder that reference assumptions that it's 75% is psychotropic. You know, so a question that would come down in a court of law would be, is 75% sufficient to classify Delta-8 as substantially similar? And, you know, interested to hear, you know, the, the opinion of Matt and other um, chemists and pharmacological experts to this point. And underscoring too that, as I mentioned, you know, DEA appears to think it does. So, um, you know, that in itself creates risk despite, you know, what the law says. Another important, um, you know, primary governing law to always remember with hemp, of course, and I'm sure no one is is forgetting these days, is is the FDA. Um, in in order to legally sell a product, it not only has to be compliant with, um, you know, controlled substances laws, but also with federal and state food and drug laws to the extent these products are intended for human consumption. And with respect to most Delta-8, which is sold in the form of a, a dietary supplement um, or a, a dietary ingredient, any new dietary ingredient you know, must comply with the FDCA, meaning it has to be subject to a new dietary ingredient notification, substantiating that it is safe for its intended use. Um, to my knowledge, I you know, don't believe a notification has been submitted for, for a Delta-8 product. So, you know, companies that are doing the safety studies on Delta-8 and understanding the safety and efficacy for, you know, an intended use, there is a pathway, you know, to compliance under the FDA um, that's necessary to legally sell these products. And another important component of the, the FDCA, which everyone is all too familiar with, is that it is prohibited to, um, in, introduce or deliver into interstate commerce any food or dietary supplement um, for which has been added either an approved drug product or a product for which substantial clinical investigations have been instituted and made public. And this is the commonly referred to as drug preclusion provision, you know, which FDA relies on to prohibit CBD as an ingredient in food and dietary supplements. Whether this provision would also preclude um, Delta-8 would depend on whether the, the status of studies um, uh, governing, you know, Delta-8 as an ingredient. And to, to, so to um, determine whether an, a novel substance such as Delta-8 THC is, you know, suitable and legal for use in a food and dietary supplement, one would need to, um, you know, confirm whether the drug preclusion applies. Look at whether there are existing studies that actually preclude this um, as an ingredient in a food or dietary supplement. And then, second, if not, you know, whether the substance is compliant with FFDCA requirements, demonstrating the safety and efficacy of the ingredient under its intended conditions of use. And those steps must be done as a pre-market step to, you know, marketing and selling this product. Um, for food products, I'll, I'll go over this quickly. It, you know, the legality depends on um, whether the the substance has been, you know, used in food, um, you know, prior to 1958. Probably not applicable here for Delta 8. You know, or if it's generally recognized as safe it, for its intended use, to my knowledge, is not for Delta 8 or is allowed pursuant to a food additive regulation. So there doesn't appear to be um, you know, a legal pathway for food under the existing, or for Delta-8 and food under the existing framework. So that's something companies will need to, um, the legal pathway that companies will need to pursue if, if it seeks to, to include Delta-8 in food. For dietary supplements, which are the most common um, uh, product types for Delta-8, 
you must submit a pre-market notice requirement to FDA that has enough data to establish that the ingredient doesn't present a significant or unreasonable risk of illness or injury when used as directed and include a detailed description of the dietary supplement, history of safe use, and other evidence of safety. Um, and the ingredient cannot present a significant or unreasonable risk of illness or injury when used on directed as the label. So in order to, to legally market um, and sell as a Delta 8 product, you know, these important safety pre-market steps through the FDA process, um, you know, must be complied with for legality and, you know, state food and drug laws often mirror um, federal laws. So, you know, they will contain, um, you know, generally uh, the, the same type of provisions. Um, in addition to having to comply with, with federal and state food and drug laws with the, the pre-market and, and safety requirements, um, it, you must check the, the state hemp laws and criminal laws, and in many states also marijuana laws, which in many cases um, prohibit, and in some cases like in, in Idaho where there's outdated laws, you know, could criminalize the production of production and sale of hemp-derived Delta-8 THC. So as with, you know, the, the, the common practice with, with any cannabis law, um, the applicable state law is incredibly important. Um, and I wanted to emphasize a number of, of practical considerations. I mentioned at the top of the call, you know, I do think as we are looking at these new cannabinoids and, you know, having this innovative research and these great opportunities to provide something um, potentially beneficial to the market, we have to make sure these products are safe and efficacious and that the research is done. And, you know, we do have a responsibility, um, you know, as an industry to do this right and um, in the interest of public health and safety. And, you know, regardless um, of the legal position one takes based on the, the Controlled Substances Act, the Analog Act, the Federal Food and Drug Act, federal and state agencies and law enforcement may not, may not agree. And it appears the DEA, you know, does take the position that this is controlled. So, you know, that opinion, um, you know, or, or uncertainty with respect to agency and enforcement um, needs to be considered in, in taking legal risk. Um, enforcement of DEA's position could be significant. That could mean criminal prosecution or, or civil forfeiture. Um, you know, there's the cannabis industry, enforcement, consumer protection agencies, um, plaintiff's attorneys are all becoming increasingly aware of Delta-8. Um, given the lack of, of safety data we have to date, you know, there's a significantly increased risk of product liability um, due to the potential and possibly unknown psychoactive effects of Delta-8 THC, um, you know, due to the, the likely lack of legality, at least under FDCA. And, um, you know, there's certainly risk of exposure there um, for, for folks across the supply chain. Um, so anyone thinking about selling these products, you know, in addition to looking at their specific processes, their safety studies, um, you know, looking at getting compliant with, with FDCA and um, the CSA, of course, it's certainly important to have insurance coverage all across the supply chain, uh, supply chain, um, you know, and contracts, documentation, confirming that the lawful source of Delta-8 is hemp, you know, testing that there's no other adulterants, um, and really due diligence to, to ensure that all, um, you know, safety protocols are, are in place as much as possible, and, you know, you're mitigating risk to the extent possible. And again, in cannabis, always critical to confirm applicable state law requirements, in addition to the federal law. And um, I'll, I'll put a pin there. Um, I, you know, given that much of the, the federal analog acts um, analysis comes down to the chemical structure and effects of these products, um, I'll turn it over to Matt here to, to tell us about that. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Matt Gunther. Uh, I've had the honor and privilege of working with industrial hemp farms for the past three years. And uh, I'm here today to kind of go over all the nerd stuff associated with Delta-8, which is, you know, my bread and butter. So I'm really excited. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share this and get to my presentation here. This is the one with images. Cool. And we'll make sure. Everybody good? All right. 
All right, so just a basic overview of what we're going to be doing today. I want to go over a brief history of Delta-8, just where it came from. I was curious myself how long it's been around. And we're going to talk about what is chemical structure. So Sean, a uh, great presentation, by the way. Thank you for that. And a great transition. You brought up how substantially similar really was never legislatively defined. When I started working with the, the Analog Act uh, over a decade ago, my biggest question from a chemical standpoint was, what is chemical structure? They never bothered to define that legally either. So um, we're gonna go over that and talk about the two-dimensional molecular geometries, three-dimensional uh, MGs. We're gonna talk about the MEP calculations for phytocannabinoids, because those are a great way to uh, talk about the electronic structure of the compound. Uh, I know a lot of people have questions about production. And so we are gonna go into the rearrangement of cannabidiol, the isomerization, lots of different methods out there. I'm not going to get too crazy into it, but at the end of this, you'll see a variety of different contact information. Uh, if you have questions you want to nerd out, get to me at one of the emails and we'll talk about it. Um, but I definitely want to talk about lab testing and some of the pharmacological implications based on the chemistry that we're seeing. So from here, brief history. Yeah, it was first reported University of Illinois in the early uh, 1940s. The journal I saw on it was August 1941. Uh, a couple of interesting things I noted. Uh, they produced it with isomerism from cannabidiol 80 years ago, same thing that we're doing now. And uh, they thought that they had a really efficient reaction at the time. They bragged about it in the paper and turns out it really wasn't that good. But uh, human volunteers, even at that time, were signing up to try it out and see what happens. I thought that was funny because that was just a couple of few years after the Marijuana Tax Act and already the scientists were out seeing what was going on with the plant. So fast forward to the mid 60s, I believe it was 1966. That's when Delta-8 THC like, it was actually structurally characterized from cannabis. And that led to more complete stereo specific methods of production. And uh, don't wanna get too long winded on that because I really wanna focus on the definition of chemical structure because uh, not only from a chemical and pharmacological standpoint but also from a legal standpoint as Sean mentioned, uh, you know, legislatively, we need to know what these terms mean. So uh, the three primary components, the first of which is molecular geometry is the one that I think most people are familiar with. If you were to Google CBD structure, that, you know, stick image with the letters, that's molecular geometry. So it's two, to, two or three dimensional arrangement of the atoms in a molecule, uh, shape, bond length, bond angles, torsional angles, which if you didn't brush up on those this morning, no worries, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Uh, we'll see those in the structures later. And basically it's, it's what most people associate with chemical structure. And up until this point, that's what's mostly been used in a court of law. And that's why, you know, starting 10 years ago, I started focusing more on the electronic and crystal structures of compounds to show that there's substantial dissimilarities in those as well. So electronic structures, it's just the motion of electron, uh, uh, you know, around a molecule, basically the electromagnetism and uh, usually involves really advanced quantum calculations. Uh, but MEPs, the molecular electrostatic potential analyses, uh, they're, they're really quick and easy ways to analyze that, that, those electronic structures. Crystal structure, we're not going to talk about too much today, but I want you to be aware of it. Uh, so this is two-dimensional molecular geometry. I think we're all pretty familiar with it. Um, chose uh, two different representations. Um, you'll see on Delta 9 on the right has a couple hydrogen atoms there coming and then on the left, you don't see them. Really why it shows those was the lines coming in and out. These are two dimensional images, but they're supposed to be three dimensional representations. So when you see things go in, you know, goofy looking lines like that, that's just trying to emphasize the three dimensional nature of the compound. And obviously as Rick and Sean have mentioned, the, the primary difference, what what's, you know, separates these compounds and their molecular geometry is the location of a double bond uh, you see in that top left ring system. So delta-8 THC, it's uh, between the eight and nine positions. Delta-9 THC, it's between the, the nine and 10 positions. So depending on the chemical, there's always a, a numbering system to, to tell you, you know, what is what. Uh, it, it depends on the different ring systems you're dealing with. So I don't want to get too long winded with that there. What I do want to explain, and I think this is important because I know there's people with different uh, knowledge bases of chemistry here. I just want to make sure I'm on time. Um, when you're looking at these structures, you know, the bottom right of each compound has what's called a pental chain. That zigzag goes down, up, down, up, down. I know just looking at things chemically that that is five carbons and as many hydrogens as it needs to be stable. That top left, I know that's CH3 because it's a carbon as many hydrogens needs to be stable. The reason that's important is because 
when you start and you know OH hydroxy, if you learn a little basic chemistry and the stability behind it, we'll go into. You're going to start seeing what in the coming years will be played with, like that pentyl chain and some of the substituents off on the top left, and that's going to really cause dramatic impacts and in, in, uh, pharmacological effect as well as chemical structure. So uh, I wanted to include uh, a comparison to CBD and CBN as well. Because what you'll see, the, the main difference, obviously, one's an agonist, one's an antagonist. And the biggest difference is, uh, obviously, the broken ring system. So on the left, delta-8 THC, tetrahydrocannabinols in general, are actually uh, tricyclic terpene, or terpenoids. Uh, they're, they're derivatives of terpenes. They're basically oxygenated uh, terpenes. And so somewhere in the structure, you can find it. Um, the reason that that's interesting, tricyclic one, two, three ring systems. CBD, this antagonist, it has a broken ring system. Doesn't look too different at the two-dimensional level, but three-dimensionally, it makes a very big difference. We're going to see that in a second. Also, really wanted to bring up a comparison, oh, went too far, to CBN, because as, as Rick has pointed out too, stability is critical, especially when it comes to these isomers. So these things are gonna you know, spontaneously isomerize based on their environmental conditions and what, where they feel most stable when. And CBN, as we talk about, you know, Delta nine is gonna degrade more rapidly into CBN compared to Delta eight, because Delta eight is more stable. CBN is kind of like where every compound is trying to eventually get to in stability. And you'll notice that CBD, Delta eight and Delta nine are all isomers with the formula C21, uh, H30O2, and that's later in the presentation. Cannabidiol, very similar, 26 carbons, uh, two, or yeah, 21 carbons, uh, uh, two oxygens and 26 hydrogens. And those losses of hydrogens are what actually ends up making the, the compound a little more stable. And we'll see that in a second. Um, wanted to bring up when I br brought up the chains before too, you might hear about THCV and THCP. Uh, one of them is just on the left here, Chase. It's just the propyl homolog. It means that instead of a five carbon chain, it's got a three carbon chain. THCP, same thing, seven carbons instead of five. Uh, the reason that's important is because as we start studying the pharmacology of these compounds, I think we're going to find drastic differences um, based on compounds that allegedly should behave similarly based on, on some of the past experiences we've had. So now we're going to get into three-dimensional uh, molecular geometry. I apologize for anybody that's looking at this and wishes that I was spinning them around. Uh, uh, I do that in real time, and I will put out videos later so you can see how I'm arriving at these. Uh, when we tried it via Zoom with the wireframes and the way I wanted to do things, it just didn't come through and render right. Um, so in looking at this, you'll notice that at the top, if you look at the wireframe of these molecules, the double bonds where they're supposed to be, the ball and stick models don't show them. It's just a software thing. But I wanted to show you when we we're talking those torsional angles I joked about earlier, what you'll see even three-dimensionally here, and you can really see it when you spin it, is that the first two ring systems are lay, lay pretty flat. And I'll show you that in a second. But then the third one, it's because of the differences in, in bond lengths, bond angles, because of that difference in the position of the double bond, it has to contort itself in, in order to actually remain stable. And so that's, that's another big thing. You'll see a side angle here. I turn it around and flipped it so that the oxygen, you know, that red dot is one of the oxygens, uh, one of the oxygen atoms in the molecule. Everything below it in that straight line is actually two ring systems, almost perfectly lined up. You'll see a little bit of, of contortion just below the red, but pretty stable. And then the third ring system at the top is contort. You know, it has to be because that's the only way that it can find stability. Do you look at, oh, I wanted to include this too, just because when we're talking about these balls and sticks, really all of these individual atoms and, and molecules are just amalgamations of energy, uh, you know, working together to form stability and, and create the compounds that we know. Um, here's CBD. I want to show you flat CBD. So again, you can see broken up ring structures. This is flat, a little different on the left. I don't want to go too far into this because the videos were better, but I want to get to CBN now and what may, you know, how you can see the stability. Keep in mind that in the wireframes, uh, the top left and bottom right ring structures have uh, as many double, they're, they're not really double bonds, they're like one and a half bonds, but it's, it's a hydrogen structure that keeps the compound stable. And this is where you can really see it. When you flip it, you can see all three of those rings are almost horizontal, you know. Uh, obviously, you can see a little bit of contortion there just to the left of that, uh, you know, front-facing oxygen atom. But 
you can start to see the, the stability three-dimensionally as you start you know, playing with some of these compounds in the software. And down the road, I'll show you some more exciting things. So that's all molecular geometry. Now I want to talk about the electronic structures of things. And this was over a decade ago. That's why I started this software, because I had to figure out a way to, to show you know, judges, potential juries, a, an electronic structure that made sense without getting into like quantum mechanics. So this is what I came up with. It's pretty easy to understand blobs of color. So what we do is we, we calculate the, the magnetic and electronic structure of the molecule using these MEP calculations. And I set the software to put in six different gradients, you know, dependent on polarity and charge. And what you can see here is delta eight at the top. So now I made it transparent so you can see the structure. And we've agreed that the two-dimensional molecular geometry has a lot of similarities, three-dimensional still some, a little less than 2D. Now we get in the electronic structure and I can go right here, that's delta nine. So again, we can still see some similarities around the oxygens as we would expect, the polarity is a little more increased. But this is really interesting when it comes to a substantial similarity standpoint is let's say, you know, I, I was a fan of impressionist paintings, right? And I wanted a Monet in my living room, but I didn't have that kind of money. So I hired somebody to make something that was substantially similar. And if I showed them this, this picture and they then delivered this one, I'd say, hey, great work, but it's not substantially similar to what I ordered. You know, I don't want to hang it in my living room. So um, obviously I included, and when I have the videos and I'm doing this real time in 3D, it's a lot more impressive because you can see just how different they are three-dimensionally because the other sides of the molecules that you can't see are pretty different. The idea is that the, the shape and polarity of these electronic structures, there's a solid argument to be made that they're substantially dissimilar. But again, that's for the courts to decide. So if you want a side-by-side -side comparison, that's a pretty good one. Um, I also included the MEPs for CBD and CBN in case you're nose. Obviously, down the road, uh, and there's a lot more calculations to do, but I think we're in our infancy of understanding the pharmacology behind some of these electronic structures and why some are producing agonism versus antagonism at certain receptors. And the pharmacology part's coming, so we'll get there soon. Definitely want to talk about production rearrangement via isomerization. I know that there's a lot of people using a lot of different methods. Uh, the labs I source from, there's three different methods that I really like, and I've encountered numerous other ones, and just not as educated about them, but I, I am educated about the chemistry behind them. People are kind enough to invite me in their labs and nerd out with me, out of respect for them and their intellectual property. I don't want to go too in-depth with it. Again, if you want to contact me personally, we can talk about it, but I do want to go over just the basis of what's occurring. So let me see if I can move this here. Let me get this out of the way. Yeah. Sorry about that. So Delta-8, Delta-9, CBD, they're all isomers like we talked about. They share the same chemical formula, C21H30O2, just, just arranged in, in slightly different ways. Um, CBN, again, chemically related, but arguably more stable because it lost the hydrogens it didn't need that was messing it up. Um, as isomers, they can spontaneously rearrange themselves depending on environmental conditions. And that's why I know that there's been some controversy about does the plant make Delta-8? Is it naturally occurring? All right, I've seen some arguments that the plant isn't supposed to be able to make this. I've seen conflicting arguments. Nonetheless, whether it can make it or not, you can pull a plant, a cannabis plant out of the ground and detect Delta-8. They did it way back in the 60s. That's how they characterized it for the full synthesis. So the reason I bring that up is whether it's the plant doing it or whether the plant is producing Delta-9 THC that is due to environmental conditions naturally isomerizing, it is naturally occurring and it is part of part of the plant, a constituent when you pull it from the ground and test it. So um, again, multiple different routes to obtain nearly identical results. Um, and, and again, we're talking about the hemp derived production of Delta-8. I cannot place enough emphasis on that. Uh, thank you, Sean, for, for emphasizing that. Um, hemp derived production begins with extracting and isolating CBD from hemp. And then from there, it generally involves a pH modulation. There are some, you know, neutral routes out there and stuff like that. But uh, generally, somebody is going to try to put it in a more in acidic environment. Um, and in the presence of, you know, the right concentrations, right conditions, it just, it does it itself. We're not doing much of anything. It just spontaneously starts isomerizing into a combination of tetrahydrocannabinols the same way it did in 1941. Uh, and then that's, you know, again, they had a, a mixture of a bunch of different, different type tetrahydrocannabinols there. 
Um, obviously, we've gotten much better over the years of, of getting exactly what we want out of the product. So anyway, there's, there's always talk about color, and this is one of the things I wanna talk about. The different acids, different catalysts, which at times are acids for these reactions, and different post-wash methodologies are all gonna to contribute to the final color. Um, the reason I bring up color, you're gonna hear a lot of people ask questions about bleach. Oh, I heard they're bleaching it and stuff. And when, when, when I hear bleach, I think of hypochlorate ions in solution. Same when I hear ammonia, I think NH4 plus ions in solution. Uh, what you may be hearing more about, I hope, is bleaching clays, which have been used in a variety of industries, for a variety of different similar reasons. Um, I hope that's what you hear. Anybody's putting hypochlorite ions in this stuff, get them out of the industry. <laughs> so, um, all right. So lab testing. This is one that a lot of people have trouble with. I included the kind of the basis of chromatography and mass spec. Um, I don't claim to be an expert on either one. I'm much more familiar with mass spec, but uh, my brother's a chemical engineer, and so he wouldn't let me live unless I fully understood chromatography at some point in my life. Um, so it is pretty simple. It's as simple as uh, dissolving a fluid uh, or dissolving your product into a fluid, which can be a gas, a solvent, water, you know, methanol, ethanol, whatever. That's your mobile phase or phases. And it carries through a column. And basically that column, the stationary phase, it's something that different compounds want to stick to for different amounts of times, basically different binding affinities. And so like how long that, that compound or that, you know, that test sample is, is in the column is what we refer to as retention times. And mass spec, like I said, you're just breaking the, the molecule apart, um, you know, either bombarding with electrons or hitting it with energy. And it, it breaks up in its constituent ions, you know, its fragments. And at that point, you had a puzzle piece and you just put together <laughs> what more than likely the structure is going to look like. So a combination of chromatography and mass spec will yield your results. Um, gas chromatography used to be more common. Most people have switched to liquid chromatography, HPLCs, high performance liquid chromatography. And that's because as most of us know by now, gas chromatography, which is run, run around 300 degrees Celsius, you know, that's more than enough energy to decarboxylate the, the compound. And, you know, my personal opinion is that THCA and Delta-9 are two different compounds and should be quantified as such, but I don't write the laws. So <laughs> I, I'm playing ball with what they say. Um, I do want to note that, again, I believe that we're in our infancy for testing uh, and testing methodologies. I don't believe that the industry will be as successful as it could be if we just keep limiting ourselves to chromatography and mass spec. I think over the next two or three years, you're going to start to see a lot of testing solutions that don't require two and three day turnaround times and, and really, I guess, less of a margin of error. And, you know, throughout the two and three years, you know, we can talk about it and, you know, talk more about what, what I think the future holds. Um, the reason this is important is not only are you guys, you know, potentially buying, selling products, transferring them across state lines. So of course, you don't want anything to, to be hot, but there's also some drug testing implications. So to, just to basically tell you what is causing the problem between Delta-8 and Delta-9, uh, which has since mostly been fixed, uh, it's the fact that they do have similar retention times and they do have similar post-ionization molecular fragments. And that's why, you know, a lot of labs are erroneously reporting Delta-8 as Delta-9 because if, if their equipment or their softwares aren't calibrated, they're not going to get those peaks are, are just are too close. Same thing with CBC and D10. We're seeing a lot of that right now as well. Um, one of the things, most of the labs have gotten better. I kind of like the fact that they're making labs register with the DEA and making it easier to do so because uh, I do want, you know, the calibrations are very important to what we're doing in research and development. And it's very important too with drug testing because I know there's a lot of people that talk about this, blah, blah, blah. Here's the science behind it. When you take a drug test, like usually a dipstick test, it's programmed to test for the presence of the drug and its metabolites, right? And so obviously Delta-8 and Delta-9, it, it's, it could definitely trick a test. I could see that happening just because obviously if the peaks on chromatograms are that similar, how's a dipstick gonna test it? When you send it into a lab, we've had confirmation personally, if the lab is capable of separating Delta-8 from Delta-9 and the Delta-8 metabolites from Delta-9 metabolites, you're fine. But if that lab isn't calibrated to do that, then they're gonna think they're looking at D9 and D9 metabolites and you could find yourself in a bad situation. And, and above and beyond all things, you know, the reason I'm in this industry is to, to, to try to help and try to move our society forward. I, you know, I don't wanna see anything bad happen to anybody. So I just wanted to be candid about that. Um, 
now the pharmacological uh, yeah, implications, and I'm almost done. Um, they're both CB1 and CB2 receptor agonists. Um, the inhibitory constant, the KI um, for D8, it's higher uh, than D9 at CB1 and CB2. Um, the higher the actual inhibitory constant, the less potentially psychotropic or psychoactive it would be. So um, D9, it's, it's stronger, it's got a stronger constant. Uh, so it's making more of an impact at CB1 and CB2. Delta 8, not so much. The reason that I think it's really important to talk about this is that we haven't really adequately modeled our endocannabinoid systems, what receptors are doing what. It's great to talk about CB1 and CB2 receptors all day, but that's why I put in those three receptor sites specifically. There's a lot of, of different novel activity at GPR18, GPR55, and GPR119, and we got to start studying that. Uh, because, as I talked about before, as we start playing with these molecules in the research and development arenas, whether it be the, the alkane chains, we're substituting those substituents, or playing with the top left, you know, they're going to have a huge impact on not just CB1 and CB2. And what we, what we see right now is the pharmacological profiles of Delta 9, Delta 8 being limited to CB1 and CB2. I don't think that that's doing those compounds justice in terms of complete pharmacological profile. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that down the road we get to spend a little more time looking into that stuff. So I guess, you know, obviously we're going to open this up to questions. Um, uh, if, if you want to contact me, there's three different places. If you want to nerd out, if this is molecular or, or product formulation based, uh, email me at mapdelta8.science. Anything about the American Cannabinoid Association, which is really a big passion project for me this year. We're going to be doing a lot of fundraising and doing a lot of stuff with HIA. Uh, definitely anything associated with this presentation or moving forward with the industry, please email the HIA directly, whether it be Rick, Ryan, uh, and you can see, see me at Matt at AmericanCannabinoids.org. And then for any information about commercializing your endeavors, especially with our vertically integrated hemp company, contact me at Matt at IndustrialHempFarms.com. And otherwise, I, I really appreciate the time and I look forward to contributing however I can in the future. Thank you so much to Rick, Ryan, and Sean. So. Thank you, Matt. Here. Appreciate that. Uh, lots and lots of good questions. Um, but before we get into that, we just want to, Ryan, if you want to click to the next slide, um, tell you about uh, the cannabinoid council we have here at HIA. We have a fiber council, a grain council, and of course, one for the cannabinoid sector. Um, really, the purpose is to convene thought leaders to find solutions distinct for the hemp cannabinoid industry. So stuff like establishing industry standards, uh, we currently work with U.S. Hemp Authority um, and their standards on the CBD side. Uh, we'd like to have similar standards like that applied to all the cannabinoids, uh, help identify best practices, make strategic recommendations, and really help expand the U.S. cannabinoid and the international cannabinoid for that market for that matter. So uh, reach out and change public policy, uh, mainly education, regulatory clarity, consumer confidence, uh, and crafts or smokable flour are all very important. So if you're interested in helping us um, with uh, leadership and expertise um, on that, please reach out to info at the HIA.org. Uh, we have a couple, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, we had quite a few uh, submitted and written in. Um, Matt, let's start with you. Um, talked a little bit about the labs, right? There's a lot of, we had a lot of questions about labs yeah. and labs uncertainty and be able to detect Delta-8 THC versus Delta-9. How do we, how would you as a company or a consumer or retailer, how do you know um, that your testing uh, agency is compliant or your testing partner is compliant and how do you know you can rely on their results when it looks like there's so much deviation in the, in the space right now? Great question. And like I said, moving forward, hopefully we, we come up with uh, better solutions and more cost-effective solutions, but really one of the most efficient ways that, that I've found really, really qualified labs is by testing with everyone and a lot and seeing which labs are capable of producing consistent results with each other. You know, if, if, if the labs are putting out the most specific result, specific results and they're all matching, it's a pretty good idea that they're good. There are, and like I said, I don't want to, I don't know how much I should uh, say or say about other companies, but there's a really, really well known and respected company here in Florida that I test with a lot. And down the road, obviously, uh, we might be doing some filming over there too, which will be pretty exciting over the next month. So you can see exactly what's happening when, when they're testing and some of the regulatory compliance behind it. But the best thing you can do 
I, what I thought is ask them real nerdy questions, see how much they really know. And, uh, you know, if, if ask them to describe, hey, man, what do you think you're seeing here? Because I know that I've had questions of, hey, why are these peaks shifting back and forth? And I could speculate till the sun sets, but unless I have more information, you know, about the equipment, and the calibration, it's kind of hard for me to know. So the best advice, I guess, is ask tough questions and, and try to educate yourself saying, no, if you're getting lied to or not. <laughs> test early and test often. All right. Yeah. Um, Sean, here's a question for you. Um, shipping laws and, and, and labeling requirements is shipping it nationwide. Um, thoughts there and then labeling what, what should be on and what shouldn't be on from a high level? Sure. Well, the on the state level, these really differ state by state with hemp. Um, in the FDA's absence of you know regulating cannabinoids, uh, states have adopted their own regulations. Um, you know, and they vary from um, you know certain ingredient requirements to QR codes to warning labels. So you really want to look at that on a state by state basis. Um, on a federal level, you know, there are certain requirements that apply to the specific product types as far as, you know, dietary supplements versus vaporizers versus edibles. And um, those will apply depending on the product type. And of course, the product would have to be um, legal under the, the FDCA to, to sell nationally. Excellent. Um, would you speak, uh, Sean, kind of quickly, would you speak to the Liability of providing consumers uh, with products that, that haven't been studied for toxicity, such as Delta 9, Delta 10, or Delta 8, Delta 10. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in general, I think there's potential for significant um, liability there um, across the supply chain. And, um, you know, especially if that product is not in compliance with federal and state food and drug laws, um, you know, and or the, the hemp and controlled substances laws. Um, but even if so, and the, the proper safety studies, if the proper safety studies aren't, um, aren't followed, then it's likely not compliant with state food and drug laws, state and federal food and drug laws. Uh, we've asked a lot of questions if this is going to be available offline. We are going to have this saved uh, and put up on the member portal. So you'll be able to log in as HI members and view uh, this recording as well. Uh, a couple more minutes. Matt, we have a question here. What other cannabinoids and byproducts result from the extraction process? Wow, so that's great, and it's a loaded question. So um, it, it depends on, if you're talking about extraction from hemp, you're going to be seeing all kinds of things. And right now, just because of a lack of really adequate reference standards and, and labs just having access to the reference standards, being able to calibrate accordingly, you don't see as much as, as you would like to. But if you specifically look for them and request the chromatograms and go through them, I after the the conversion process really if, if we're you know through the isomer isomerization we're starting to see peaks for things like cbe uh cbdm uh some of these other things that that uh i'm really excited about uh pursuing and then also uh down the road there's no limit to what we can potentially do depending on on obviously the legal framework but i think that we're going to be heavy into research and development for the you know producing you know the phytocannabinoids that we know and love, but but don't really have in extractable quantities right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if that adequately answers the question, but what we're seeing, like, you know, when you're seeing a 95 and a 96% and it's crystal clear and you're like, well, what's the other two or 3%? A lot of them are, are minor cannabinoids that just don't really have, uh, you know, verified reference standards in a lot of labs right now, so. Um, this is a question for, for both of you, and this is, I think, a general great question for, for retailers or wholesalers. Uh, there's so many companies right now, right, jumping on board. If you look online, um, selling Delta 8, um, what are the top things to look for to ensure you're getting quality products? Uh, let's start with, Sean, let's start with you, maybe the top couple of things, and then Matt, your perspective. Um, I guess I can I can speak to the the legal side. Um, of course, you're going to want to prove that the the product is sourced from legal hemp, and you know having that the supplier's verification of of uh, you know their their hemp license, um, the appropriate testing, and you know not just THC content, but also you know contaminants and um, adulterants and you know. Um, good testing, getting a good certificate of analysis. And um, like Matt said, I, I do think it's efficacious to have multiple testing. Um, and then, you know, just uh, 
supply chain and custody documents to make sure the product is lawfully, you know, transferred throughout its its supply chain and, you know, not subject to any contaminant on its way. Um, and, you know, of course, on the, the legal side, the the studies substantiating safety and efficacy for the, the intended use. Matt, what are your thoughts? I guess my initial thought would be, I guess if you're in this industry and, and you're, you know, going through retailers and, and different you know, companies that you might want to source from or buy from. The first thing I would look for is to see if I own it, because if I do, I would buy from that one. Uh, if not, <laughs> I would I would suggest that you you really take the time uh, to to work uh, principle to principle to see uh, you know how involved the company and their owners are with the industry. Are they just somebody that was trying to throw some money at something, or are they really passionate about it? Because I know myself and all the people we work with at IHF and, and all the people we're lucky enough to network with and, and the HIA, uh, you know, we're really committed to doing the right thing. And it seems to be that when people are committed to doing the right thing in this industry and for the right reasons, they get the best results. So I think the integrity is the first thing I look for in any company, knowledge and integrity. So. Um, excellent. Let's see. How are we, how are you ensuring that byproducts um, of Delta eight uh, isomerization rate are safe uh, for consumption? How do you assume that other Matt, I guess in this example, other 2%, how do you assume uh, that that is, or do you assume that that's safe for consumption? Well, one of the things to consider is that, uh, you know, in view, and it's different for each person or whatever, but I have the luxury of actually looking at the chromatograms too. So, you know, it, I know that they're testing for specific things, but it's pretty clear if something goes wrong. You know what I mean? If you're getting up to a certain thing, and again, that's something I can, I can probably speak a little more to in depth when we have a little more time. But uh, yeah, there's, based on every chromatogram I've seen that I've ever sold before I release product, we're, we're, we're very good. And I can actually, that might be a good next presentation is, is how I, how I uh, come to that conclusion, so. Uh, one final question, does the HIA endorse Delta-8? Recall in 2015, the HIA shunned CBD uh, thoughts. So, so the mission of the HIA is, is to advance the hemp economy and educate the market for the benefit of the members the public and the planet. So the recent growth of the hemp derived CBD market not only provides economic opportunity uh, and new market access to hemp farmers, processors, manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. So uh, it's our belief as a board and as an organization that access to safe, legal hemp derived Delta-8 and other cannabinoids is important for the continuing industry expansion and, and for the stability of the industry. Um, so we are excited for uh, these markets to continue to develop uh, again, we, we welcome uh, you guys to join the Cannabinoid Council and have conversations with us, help us set strategy moving forward, uh, help protect and expand these markets. Uh, you can find info at the HIA.org uh, for that. Wanted to take uh, a moment again. Thank you very much, Matt, with Industrial Hemp Farms and Sean with Vicente Cedarberg uh, for your time and expertise. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, again, we'll post this up on the members portal um, at the HIA.org. Thank you very much. Have a great day. To learn more about the Hemp Industries Association and to become a member, go to www.thehia.org.